Good morning and welcome to The Battles Within. We're continuing our study entitled, Who is Jesus? We have achieved session number 70. If you've been with me over all of them, I appreciate it. If you've not, go to our website at uh, www.thebattleiswithin.com and then you should be able to find uh, uh, battle plans and under battle plans it says, Who is Jesus? And you can find it there. You can also look at our Facebook page. We do have here uh, links to that. So having said all that, we're going to go ahead and jump right in and get going here. Today we're continuing our uh, message that we began last week. Uh, we had parables last week that Jesus had begun to talk to the Pharisees about. And uh, today will be the second one. And uh, just as a way of reminder... Um, after cleaning the temple, you remember, Jesus walked by a barren fig tree on the side of the road. And after seeing no fig, no fruit, no figs, only leaves, he cursed the tree. And a short while later, it withered and died. You find that in Matthew 21, 18 through 19. And Jesus uses this as an, ob as an object lesson to rebuke Israel and their leaders. Uh, the shame of their fruitlessness uh, was exemplified by their rejection of the Messiah. You know, once again, however, the Pharisees who proven themselves spiritually barren, they were, I don't understand why they could not see this, were determined to challenge Jesus' authority. The Pharisees no longer denied that Jesus had authority. This was, Remember, this is the week that he's going to be crucified. They never denied his, they couldn't deny his authority. Instead, they asked, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? In other words, we know you have power. We know you have authority. But by whose power and authority do you have it? You know? Uh, they asked this, of course, in hopes that Jesus would trap himself. Because Jesus had already publicly out there in the open in the wilderness stated many times that his authority came from above. You know, so it's not something he hasn't already done. But instead... Jesus turns the table on the Pharisees by asking them what authority did the, where did the authority of John the Baptist come from? Well, this kind of put the Pharisees in a difficult position because, as you remember, John the Baptist was widely respected as a prophet, as a teacher of Israel. And so uh, uh, John the Baptist was one who had publicly heralded that Jesus was the Lamb of God and the Messiah. So if they gave him authority, then his authority would give authority, would recognize the authority of Jesus. So to do that, but the Pharisees, if they if they uh, uh, if they denied John's legitimacy, they feared the people because the people believed him to be a very strong prophet. He's dead now. You know, he, he was he was martyred, but they still believed in him. Matter of fact, there's still people today as we looked at in the past, who are still, there's still a, a cult out there for John the Baptist. They do a lot of ceremonial washing, because what else is there to do? But there is a large group of people out there that's doing that. So, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the, so the question kind of silenced the Pharisees. You know, um, but Jesus gives them a chance to recognize their sins in hopes that, that they'll repent. It's interesting that God gives us opportunity after opportunity. He gives every single person the opportunity to repent of their sins, even when he knows they're not going to do it. He gives them that opportunity anyway because they need that. He, he's not a respecter of person. He gives everybody the same opportunity. People die and go to hell not because God wants them to, but because they've chosen that for themselves by rejection of Jesus Christ. Not from lack of God trying to get them, to urge them, to persuade them. It's through their rebellion that they go to hell. So now we studied the parable of the two sons last week. That, um, well, we say Jesus used these two parables and, and uh, to try to convince them of, of where they were and what was happening. So we studied the two parables, the parable of the two sons last week, which shows that the Gentiles who had forgotten God originally, uh, that said they would not follow him, but they turned. So the Gentile nation rejected God completely. But after Jesus came and they accepted him, a large number of Gentile nations, America had been, I just saw uh, like a few weeks ago where Britain is no longer a Christian nation. 
that only 44% of the people believe that, they're, that they believe in Jesus. Well, or believe that they're Christians. There's a lot of people who proclaim to be Christians that are not, but only 44% even proclaim it. So I wonder what that percentage is in America. That number is considerably is dropping quickly. I still believe we're technically still a uh, Christian nation, but I'm sure the number is dropping. Um, most people, that, that they'll say that they're Christians, but not actually Christians, but if they're going to associate themselves with a religion, they'll attach it to Christianity. But anyway, <clears throat> so the Gentiles who have forgotten God in the past came back to God and ended up following him, though they said they would not. And then therefore they may, but the Jews who were told about God, who said that they would serve God through the Abrahamic promise and the covenant, rejected God. They said they would do it, and then they did not. And so Jesus gives them the statement that, that, that the he asked them which one of them is going to go into heaven first before the other one. And the, the, the Jews who knew the truth said they would follow, but did not follow. So today we're going to go into the next parable of the, disc, of the same discourse. And this is the parable of the unfaithful servant. We're just I'm still reading the whole scripture today. For time, we're just going to start with verse 33. He said, hear another parable. So Jesus didn't give them time to respond. Say, he says, hear another parable. He goes right into the parable. Here's the situation. There was a certain householder, the person who was legally owned the property, which planted a vineyard. He planted a vineyard so his family could enjoy the fruit later. He hedged around about it. So he put hedges on it to protect it from outside predators, whether that be human or animal. He digged a wine press for it, so he equipped the property with everything he needed to make the wine that he needed. And he built a tower uh, so that the field would be protected from intruders so that they could actually see if anything was coming. And he says, and let, and let it out to husbandmen and went, on, went into a far country. So having finished all the preparation, he hired an overseers or tenant farmers, you could say, to overlook, to look after the vineyard and to work the wine press. And after he said, he went into a far country, trusting these husbandmen would do their work. Verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit thereof, fruits of it. So when the time was drawn near, a good amount of time had passed. You know, when the landowner hired the husbandmen and now... A report produced by the University of California Cooperative Extension entitled Establishing a Vineyard stated that no crop production in the first few years, not until year four or five. At least another year is required to produce the first vintage. It takes a minimum of 11 to 13 years to get into a positive net income position. So in other words, uh, they gave them plenty of time. It was a long period of time that they took after the vineyard that he provided support and everything for them over this time period before he asked anything of them. You know, God gave Israel a command concerning vineyards when they came into the land of Canaan. Leviticus 19, 23-25 said, And when they shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manners of tree for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised to you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord with all. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. So see, the Mosaic law even forbid the eating of the orchard fruit until the fifth year. Therefore, considerable amount of time had passed here between the owners leasing the vineyard and sending the servants to collect the dues. Then it says here, he sent his servants to the husband. In ancient times, rent is paid with either money or the share of the crop. In this instance, the share of the crop was required. You know, Jesus doesn't explain the terms of the original contract. The success of the vineyard or the amount of the fruit of the owner expected to be received. He doesn't say which it was. He just said that, that, that he went back to them to get his due. Undoubtedly, the owner expected some reasonable return on investment because he sent his servants to make the collection. Now, there's a distinction between the servants and the husbandmen. Servants represented the Old Testament prophets. So here in this proverb here, the servants represented the Old Testament prophets. The husbandmen are representing these Jewish leaders. That's the analysis, that's the analogy or allegory that Jesus is using. Jesus is using the, the servants are the prophets of God 
and the because the landowner is clearly God. So the servants were the prophets or the men of God that came bearing the word of God to collect from them, and the husbandman was the Jewish leaders. He said he sent his servants to the husbandman. So from time to time, God sent prophets to the Jewish nation to call both the priest and the people back in the purity of his holy religion. Right? He just, periodically, he would send them back. We know the, we got the prophets, the books of the prophets. He said that they might receive the fruit of it. The ancient custom of paying rent of a farm in kind, you know, the part of the farm's produce, kind of like sharecroppers, you could say. So in Jesus' previous discussion, <clears throat> the Jewish leaders, verse 23, the issue of one of authority, right? Whose authority? For hundreds of years, God sent prophets with his authority demanding the fruit of obedience and repentance. God expects us to be obedient and to repent of our sins. That's what he asks of the Jewish people. That's what he asks of us today. The last of these, John the Baptist, also demanded the fruit of repentance. Remember, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so he was the one, the same thing he was requiring of them, the fruit. The fruit was the fruit of repentance. In almost every instance, however, Israel rejected the message. By rejecting these servants and subsequently his son, the Jews proved themselves unworthy. The vineyard will be taken from them because they were unworthy. Verse 35, And the husband took his servants, so it says they seized and laid hold of them rudely. So God sent his servants, in this case the prophets, to them, in this case the vineyard, they sent his servants to them, and the husbandmen, the people who were given the task to do what they were supposed to do, took and laid hold on these servants. It said rudely and violently is what it really means. Uh, they were far from treating them with any respect they deserved at all. And uh, the servants of the landowner by whom they were given the job of serving as a husband of his vineyard. Remember, these were the servants of the landowner. These were the servants of the person who owns the land that they're working on. I mean, how much more respect do you do with that? You know, it's kind of like if you're working independently and your boss sends someone from his main office to check out your work, how would you treat them? You're going to treat them very well. I mean, you know, uh, it's like uh, if an IRS agent comes to check out your stuff, you're going to treat him with respect, right? Because he reports to the government. <laughs> so you're going to try to treat them with respect. You don't want to get them mad and angry. Well, they did, they, mis they not only did they mistreat the service, but they refused to give an account to the landowner. Uh, this is an account that this is something they had committed to do, you remember. Instead, it says here, and they beat one. So one of the servants was hit with his fist. This is kind of an example here that Jesus has given us. Remember, Jesus used this allegory because of what, how the way they treated the prophets. So he said one was hit with a fist. Jeremiah, when he was struck by Passer, the son of Emer, the priest, was one of these husbandmen. The Emer was one of these husbands. It says, now, now, Pastor, the son of Emer, the priest, one of these husbandmen who were given the task to do what was right, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, okay, he was a big leader. He was definitely a, one of the husbandmen, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pastor smoke Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of God. So we see here, this is a perfect example. Jesus gives an example here. One was hit. He's talking about Jeremiah as an example. This is the way you treated God's servants. He said another was killed. Hebrews 11, 36 through 37 tells us, And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheep's coat and goat's king and being destitute, afflicted, tormented. See, the world will kill them. Those husbands, those leaders who are supposed to be right with God. How many Christians have been martyred during the, during the, uh, um, during the Protestant Revolution? How many did the Church of England, or the, the Church of England, the Church, well, the Church of England too, but the Catholic Church take and kill and martyr because of their Christian faith? How many uh, Romans took Christians into the arena and filleted them alive and killed them? You see, but this, we're talking about leaders of the church, the Catholic Church, the, 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 the leaders of their days. 
who rebelled against God and took the leaders, took those people that were right with God, and they killed them. There's four kinds of power, four kinds of death in the power of the Sanhedrin. They had the ability to kill by beheading with a sword, stoning, burning, or strangling. That was, uh, that were given that in the Sanhedrin gave them the power to do. They could kill, stone, burn, strangle. Notice they could not crucify. That's the reason why they didn't kill Jesus. They wanted Jesus crucified. It's interesting. The prophet in the time of Elijah were killed with the sword. 1 Kings 19, 14 said, And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down their altars, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I am only left, thy seek my life to take away. This was something that, that Elijah said when he was talking to God. They have thrown down thine altar and slain thy prophets with the sword. Daniel 11.33 said, And they that understood among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many day. Daniel prophesied that the prophets would be killed. It's then it says, And another stoned another. Matthew 23.37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou hast killed the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee. This is the words of Jesus. Jesus said, You stoned the prophets. See, these seem to have been hurt by hurling stones at them, but not killing them. They weren't; These weren't killed. Those stoned others, they weren't killed, but they were stoned. Paul was stoned several times, but left or dead, but wasn't dead. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. These husbands in pattern regarding how they treated any of the landowner's servants. These were patterns. It says more than the first. This indicates that he, that he sent greater servants, hoping they would listen. He kept sending, he sent the lower servants, and he kept sending more powerful people in the, the that were right with God, more of his elite people, you could say. Yet they did the same to them. The landowner did everything he could to get these people to meet their requirement, but they did not care. Verse 37. And last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. So last of all, in the last times, in the last days, in the end of the world, the Jewish world, that is, after all, the prophets have been sent, finished their course, no more prophets. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. You said, but he's in the New Testament. He's in the New Testament that we de dedicate New Testament. But John was before the resurrection, the crucifixion of Christ. Therefore, he was the Old Testament saint. He was the he was under the Old Testament promise. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. Until Jesus died on the cross, he was not the Redeemer. He was the Savior to come, but he was not the Savior yet. He had to die for our sins. His blood had to be sacrificed. He had to pour his blood on the altar before he became our our penal, our payment for our sins. It was coming. But it hadn't happened yet. He was part of the Old Testament saints. See, God sent his, then he said, because that, he sent, the God finally sends his son. Uh, this is not one of his servants as before, but his son, his only begotten son, the son of love, his dearly beloved one. He sent him to the husband and the Jews. The son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was sent only to the house of Israel. Jesus was not sent to the Gentiles. He was sent to the house of Israel. Why? Because the house of Israel was given the task of evangelizing the world. I said this. God came to save the Gentiles. And he did. He selected the house of, of Abraham, the family of Abraham, to do it. See, God loved the world. He gave his son for the world. He's not willing that any should perish. God is the God of the Gentiles, not just the Jews. The Jews were used. So God sent his son, Jesus, but this to the house of Israel to fulfill their promise that through the house of Abraham, the world would be saved. And that's what happened. Jesus came as part of the tribe of Abraham through David, the king, to the house of Judah, born in Bethlehem, as we celebrate at Christmas time, so that he could redeem the world. So through that, the world is saved. So Jesus came to the house of Israel. He was the great prophet raised among them. He was sent to bless them by turning them from their iniquities. He came to them to his own, to them of his own nation, but they received him not. Saying, they will never reverence my son. 
Since the Son is the same power and presence as the Father, one would assume he would be treated like the Father. You would assume that if the Son comes, he's the heir. He has the same authority as the Father. You would assume that he would be treated the same as the husbandman himself, I mean, as the landowner, the Lord himself. The Son of God is to be reverenced equally as his Father. The Son is in nature and glory equal to the Father. It's the will of the Father that the Son should be reverenced. The angels in heaven reverence Him. He's reverenced by the saints both in heaven and on earth. Verse 38. But when the husbands saw, his, saw the Son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill Him and seize Him on His inheritance. So the husband recognized the Son. Many of them knew Him on sight. Some did not. Some were entirely ignorant of Him. Some knew Him but would not accept His authority over them. The Pharisees expected the Messiah about this time. They knew by prophecy it could not be long before he appeared. And when they saw Jesus of Nazareth, they knew him by various circumstances. By all the characters of the Messiah seen in him, by his miracles, then he must be the same. There were these people that were trying to kill the Messiah here knew him to be the Messiah. All, all stars pointed to him. All roads pointed to him. All arrows pointed pointed to him. They believed him to be the Messiah. You understand? That's, that's, that's what's bad. These people actually believed him to be who he was, yet rejected him, just like these husbandmen did. They knew this was the son, the heir, yet they rejected him. They said among themselves, they did this privately because they feared the people if they did openly, this is the heir. Note, these men did what they did with full knowledge of who he was making him the heir to the throne of Israel, the government of the Jewish nation, as he was the son of David. They knew him to who he was. They may not have understood, and not only was that he promised the Messiah, but he was the son of God. All that his father has, as he is natural, essential, and the only begotten son. And what did they say? Knowing him to be who he was, what did these people say? Come, let us kill him. And let us seize upon his inheritance. They deliberately developed a plan. We will kill the heir. We will know, we know who he is, but we're going to kill him. This will prevent change. We don't want change. If we, if we accept him, the change is going to occur resulting from his heir. The heir would not allow them to continue their way of power and control. Their way of life was going to change. Knowing this, they determined the only course of action is to kill the heir. To take his inheritance. Their nation would be in peace. Their temple would stand. The temple worship and service would continue. They remained in their office and authority undisturbed. What? Think about how vicious, evil these men were. To know he was the Messiah, yet reject him. Verse 39. And they caught him and cast him. They caught him in a rude and violent manner, they seized and laid hold of him as they had some, uh, had some of the service before. This regarded their apprehending of Christ in the garden by the band of soldiers, right? This is what happened then. The chief prayer, chief priests and Pharisees who with swords and staves took him, bound him, and led him away. Perfect example here that Jesus gives them in this parable. It says they cast him out of the vineyard. It's not to be understood that they cast him out of the synagogue, which is never said of them, not related, to the lead, not related to the leading of him without the gates of Jerusalem where they crucified him, though this is a sense not to be despised or rejected. So this doesn't refer to him being kicked out of the synagogue. It doesn't refer to him being taken out of the gate to be crucified. But it's related to the delivering of him to those that were without the vineyard, the Jewish nation, and the church, to the Gentiles. They took him out of their family, out of their vineyard, and cast him out into the world where the Gentiles were. Praise God for that. Because of their evilness, we have high life. We have hope. We can preach the gospel today to you on this medium today. See, what they did to harm, God did to good. He cast them out to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and put to death by them. The Gentiles, the, the Hebrew, he, they cast them out of the temple. The, the Gentiles, remember the Romans, Gentiles killed him. It said they slew him. Jesus was physically killed by the Gentiles. Yeah, they were sentenced to death by Pilate, the heathen governor, and he was crucified by his Roman soldiers. 
but Jesus was strategically killed by the Jewish leaders through the instigation and pressing desire of these husbandmen, these Jewish rulers. And then afterwards, the apostles were charged these having murdered Jesus. They charged the, the, the leaders. Acts 2, 22-23 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. They knew who he was. Verse 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified his life. You knew who you were crucifying. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I didn't know he was. You knew who he was and you did it anyway. Verse 40, when the Lord, therefore, the vineyard cometh. Okay, every day, but every dog gets his day, right? When the Lord of the vineyard cometh to hold them accountable. To hold them accountable for the fruit that they were to bring, for their abuse of his servants, the prophets, and for the murder of his own son. God had something to hold against these men. What will he do unto these husbandmen? So the question is put to the chiefs, priests, and elders, and the scribes. They allow the address, the Pharisees he's addressing to be judges in this case. I'm going to let you be the judge. What is the landowner going to do? What is the Lord going to do when he comes for these things? Remember what God had promised would happen to the vineyard of these husbands in Isaiah 5, 4 through 7. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grape, brought it forth wild grapes. And go now, I will tell you that I, what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it will be pruned, not pruned, nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plains, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, and for righteousness, but behold, a cry. God destroyed. A few years later, Jerusalem completely and destroyed all the walls, just like this says here, because of these men and those wicked people, because they rejected Christ, because they, they did not bring fruit, because they uh, killed and bruised the servants, and because they sacrificed his only begotten son. No doubt this passage was in the Lord's thoughts when he spoke this parable, verse 41. And they said unto him, this is probably the pair of Pharisees to whom he was speaking, and the Pharisees not see themselves as the target of this parable. I don't understand how they cannot see themselves as the target of this parable, but they did not. They said, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. The Pharisees' judgment was profound, wasn't it? He will miserably destroy these wicked men. The person guilty of such crime as beating, killing, and stoning servants sent to them by the, the, by the proprietor of the vineyard to receive his due and proper fruit and at last murdered his son and heir were very wicked persons and deserved the severest punishment to be inflicted upon them and that without mercy. This must and would be unavoidable, unavoidably their case when the Lord of the vineyard should come. This proclamation condemns themselves as wicked men and as deserving of the worst of death. These were the very men who in the last few days after this were guilty of planning, executing the death of the Son of God. And then they go on to say, and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen. So after punishing these wicked men who rejected and killed the Lord's heir, the Pharisees proclaimed that the vineyard should be taken away from those and given to another. Which is exactly what happened. The Jews rejected Jesus. God turned to the Gentiles to tend his vineyard, and we have since then. It was a righteous thing with God to remove the church state, gospel, and ordinance from the Jews and deliver it to the Gentiles. And he says, they're going to say, which shall render him the fruit in their season. The new husband will receive the reward that should have been these of the original husbandmen. We as Gentiles have been able to experience the greatness of the Father in our ministries as a result of those religious Jews' rejections. It's not salvation. It is not that salvation is not free to all. It is. But the leadership of the Gentiles having the church should have been with the Jews. But their leaders rejected it. The, the, the world has been led by the Gentiles and the evangelizing of the world has been done through Gentile organizations. Gentile nations around the world have preached and proclaimed the gospel. And that's where the big push is coming from. 
It should have been coming from the nation of Israel. Verse 42. And Jesus said unto them, So Jesus looked at them, Name, namely, with great compassion and solemnness, Jesus never wants someone to die and go to hell. He said, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builder rejected the same and become the head of the corner? He refers to a quote from Psalms 11, 23 The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. See, Jesus said, it's not th If this is not what Psalms 118 means, then what else could it mean? Kind of rhetorical question. As if he said, if the vineyard is not to be taken from you and given to another, then what is the meaning of these words? Do they not plainly foretell the Messiah shall be rejected by the Jewish leaders, their teachers, the rulers, the builders of the church and the commonwealth? Though they put him to death, he shall become the head of the corner and the head of the church? What else could this be but a clear statement? The Gentiles shall believe in Jesus. Jesus will unite them to the church of God as head cornerstone connects the two sides of the building. This is the Lord's doing, he says, and is marvelous in our eyes. The rejection of the Messiah by the Jews, his reception among the Gentiles, and their admission into the church are all very wonderful events. This is all brought about as part of God's plan by the Father. He knew these Jewish leaders would reject God and there reject his son, and therefore his plan was, once they reject them, to turn it to the Gentiles. Verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God, Therefore I say unto you, I tell you plainly, he said, as a result of your rejection of God's plan, God himself has long expressly foretold that this judgment would happen to you. This is the right, most righteous and equitable judgment. He says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. He says, I plainly tell you, the kingdom of God, which you have vilely and ungratefully condemned and abused, contempted and abused shall be taken from you and given to a nation. That is the gospel of Christ will be taken from you and carried to the Gentiles who will have more regard for the favor shown them and improve it much better than you've done. Dr. Campbell stated that is one of the clearest predictions of the rejection of the Jews and the call of the Gentiles which we have in this history. God clearly showed the path. Verse 44. And whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. Now this not be understood that to mean those who believe in Christ, the soul casting itself on Christ, the foundation stone, relying on Him, building all its hope of happiness and salvation on Him. It's not be understood to those who, to, who believe in Christ. God's not going to do that to you. This refers to those to whom Christ is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, the Jesus is the foundation of the cornerstone. To those who reject him, he is a stumbling block. He says, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. Those who reject Christ will suffer for their decisions. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man come to follow but by me. Hebrews 10, 26-31 says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. These men have received the knowledge of truth. But a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherein he was sanctified an unholy thing, and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now I would argue that this mostly is related to, to apostasy. And I agree it's related to apostasy, but I think it is also a political, I mean, pol uh, applicable to the Jewish leaders who knew the truth. Prior to the salvation of God, prior to the, the death of Jesus on the cross, the Old Testament saints, I believe it falls under them too. They were apostates in the day of the Old Testament. Verse 45, And when the priests, chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, now we see the meaning of the Sanhedrin went among. We didn't know who they were. Now we know chief priests and the Pharisees. The Sanhedrin was there. Not all the priests or Pharisees were involved in this plot to kill Jesus, but the Sanhedrin was. 
They considered both parables of Jesus here, the son of the two sons and the wicked vineyard. When they did both, they perceived that they spake of them. The two sons saw themselves as the one who promised but did not go. In the wicked husband, they saw themselves there also. They were the husbands that acted ungrateful part of the householder, the cruel one to his servant who would and would to would to his son, and in that in his conscience told them they were the men. They knew the whole was leveled against them and designed for them and exactly hit their case. This was a direct bullseye. And they knew it was. Verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, instead of accepting what they said and recognizing what they were saying was true, what did they do? They again rebelled. Men rebel against God. They sought to lay hands on him. Not, only, not that they attempted to, by any outward action to apprehend him and carry him off or by any immediate violent action to take away his life, but they secretly wished and earnestly desired to do it. They were so irritated and provoked that they could scarcely keep their hands off him, could have been glad of an opportunity to execute their vengeance upon him. They would have fulfilled what Jesus in his parable had prophetically said of them. That moment. And were so hardened they were, though they understood his meaning, they were not deterred thereby on any of their accounts. But they feared the multitude. Jesus had just entered the city in a grand celebration. The multitude believed him to be the prophet. If they had attempted anything of his nature, they would have been in great danger. And said, why? Because the people viewed, took him as a prophet. They did all believe, they did all believe him to be a prophet. They might not believe him to be the Savior, but they believed him to be a prophet. By the doctrine which he taught, by the boldness and freedom of his speech, by the miracles that he wrought, they believed him to be a prophet. Not all men accepted him as a Messiah, but did accept that he was a teacher sent from God, that he was endowed with wonderful gifts. Many among the crowd had received those gifts, not necessarily for their souls, but yet for their bodies. The crowd, therefore, would not suffer him to be abused and ill-treated by them. Mark says in Mark 12, 12, And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. They left him and went their way to consult together on what was proper to be done, to wait for a better opportunity to seize him. What a powerful parable we've seen today. And what a powerful foretelling of the truth. What a better understanding of what happened in the plan of God. See, the parables laid out for us. Jesus laid out for us exactly what happened and why we are where we are today. And why the Gentiles are where they are today is because God laid it out for us thousands of years ago. It's not a surprise. We are a part of the plan. Next week, we'll continue our study on the parables of Jesus as we continue to study who is Jesus. All we have time for today, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we can study your word. I thank you, Lord, for your word. It is powerful. Help us, Lord, to be able to apply it. Help us, Lord, to share with others the truth that you've given us. Help us, Lord, not to reject him, but to accept him. Lord, let us us accept the, the, the words of the prophets. Let us accept the gifts, the fruits of the prophets. Let's give them back the repentance that you asked for. Give them back, Lord, the blessings that you send our way. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I thank you today for your time and your attention. We're going to continue to study the Who is Jesus series. I think we have a few more weeks left in the parables. We'll see whatever God leads us. But we have a lot to cover in the life of Jesus so we can better understand who Jesus is. Until next time, God bless you.